Yes, I'm drinking a pint of mojito. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. I am Cammy Balak, back in the host seat and uh, I'm, I'm still getting to grips with all the buttons I've got to press because I've just, just had me and Johnny covered up by our big banner. I'll get the hang, I'll get back into it. John, You've been John's done a good job. It's been a while, yeah. So in that there you can hear Johnny McGinty. Good evening, Johnny. Good evening, how are we doing? Um, so yeah, podcast tonight. Um, if you are watching live, then you'll be watching live on either YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, or Facebook. We say hello to anybody who's there from our Hugh Dan's fans secret Facebook group for our patrons. Um, if you want to sign up for bonus weekly content, go to patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast or search for Scottish Rugby Podcast, and you can sign up from three pounds a month and because of that, you then get a bonus weekly episode. I'm going to start with a little bit of a trigger warning for this podcast, for people that might be tuning in. I don't want anybody to be surprised later on. For people who have been following the news closely, uh, Rufus McLean has pled guilty to uh, domestic abuse charges in the last couple of days. 
We will be discussing that later on the main podcast. That's likely to go into the Patreon podcast itself. So I'm making people aware that we are going to be discussing that in this episode. So anybody affected by those issues, um, there is a link in the um, podcast description and on the video descriptions to where you can get help if you're affected by any of those issues. However, we are going to start with some news. We're waiting, Craig. We're going to talk about the thistles as well in the main podcast. Then we'll do a bit, talk a little bit about the issues around the uh, Rufus McLean guilty plea. And then in the uh, Patreon podcast, we'll talk about the Scotland um, Six Nations men's squad selections. We're not putting that behind the paywall for any other reason than we think the Rufus McLean thing raises a lot of issues we think are worthwhile talking about. Um, we want to celebrate women's rugby as well. Um, we think that's really important, obviously. And and to be honest, the men's squad announcement, as fun as it is to talk about, is pretty low down the list of priorities this week. So um, we're, we're putting in the Patreon podcast for that reason. News though, Johnny. Glasgow have... Um, Glasgow have uh, are almost through the last sixteen of the, uh, the what does it John call it the Clown Cup? Yep, yeah, the Mickey Mouse Cup. Um, Mickey Mouse Cup because because um, because because Bristol Bristol right. got whoa, whoa, some whoa. admin wrong. Hang on, Glasgow were through to the last sixteen anyway on their own merit, um, okay. but they are basically guaranteed. Well, as good as got. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. They need one point tomorrow night against Bath to be guaranteed a home last 16 game. It was previously a little bit more complex than that. Uh, we were waiting on results across the rest of the competition, but then, yeah, Bristol got docked five points for fielding Elliot Stook twice in the early rounds <laughs> when he was ineligible. Like, once is, once is careless. <laughs> twice. Um, so he played in both of their first two games and they've been docked five points for that uh, and now Glasgow need one point against Bath tomorrow night for a home game. Yeah, it's a strange one. I can understand where the rule's there, but they, it appear, from what I can understand is he was obviously made redundant by Wasps, so Bristol have picked him up on a temporary contract, but he has signed a longer-term contract with a club in France and that's... That they had an exception for the fact he'd come from Wasps, I think, but now because he signed on long term somewhere else, it's yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big old mess. And um, I mean, to be fair, there's a there's a lot of fairly obvious administrative errors going on around Bristol. So although this one isn't really their fault, it's kind of symptomatic of what's happening at the club and general i think yeah we've got john mcdonald and dougie they'll point out that he, he was eligible then became ineligible after he went elsewhere <laughs> retrospectively ineligible is what's happened but yeah <laughs> i guess that's you know that was if there was always given he was on a short-term contract there was always a chance he was going to be retrospectively ineligible and they probably should have thought about that rather than just yeah throwing on the pitch without checking the paperwork paperwork's important admin is important yes yeah Get your admin right. Always get your admin right. Yeah. Um, we've got somebody else. So you've got the um, Glasgow Bath game tomorrow um, away. I think you're going to get a point. Uh, home tomorrow. Home home oh, yeah. Sorry. I lose track. I think <laughs> you... We should get a point from it, at least. Yeah. I feel like Glasgow, Honestly, Glasgow's performances just... have been good enough. Yeah, losing bonus point? Is that what you're hoping for? I'm getting the digs in because Craig's not here yet. <laughs> but you feel like you've got to do it for him? I feel like I've got to get... I'm just trying to get balance. <laughs> I, f I feel like uh, I'd be extremely disappointed with a losing bonus point, but at least we'd have a home last 16 game. Yeah. I think a, I think a team that's got 14 from a possible 15 from the first three matches could probably manage a point at home against Bath. Is what I would say. Yeah, we'd hope so. Um, the other bits of news then were uh, Murray McCallum signed for Edinburgh, which is, I th it's lovely to see that he's got a contract and that's great. And it's taken a while, I think, from to to find something. Um, you would imagine that's down to some Scotland shenanigans of we really, really need props. Yeah, I mean, I 
given the timing of his of his contract and stuff, I fully expected him to see it to see him in the Scotland squad. I was quite surprised. Yeah. Because you know yeah. like, when the whole Ben Healy thing happened, it was very obvious that that was being done when it was being done because we're desperate for a, a ten as well. I thought it was the same the same theory with money, but apparently not. No. But yeah, but it's time for him. It's a good move for M Brown for him. Mm-hmm. So good to see him back in, in Scotland. Interestingly, there's obviously been an identified um need for more props in Scotland because they've started prop school. Why yes. they haven't called it proper I don't know why they haven't called it proper idol. <laughs> they've called it prop school. So the SIU are launching this basically they're looking for that they, they, they want to kind of bring encourage more youngsters to be interested in the dark arts of the scrum. Mm-hmm. Which is a hard. You just tell them you can eat as many chips as you want. Well, this is it, right? Right in the. I'm not saying you know. I'm not saying all. I'm not saying all props are fat lads. I'm not fat shaming anyone, but it does help. I, I do. Yeah, I mean, in the in in these days of you know tackling childhood obesity, is that the underlying? Is that the underlying? Is public health our public health campaigns to blame for the lack of props <laughs> in Scotland? <laughs> The people behind Healthy Living Scotland are so good at their jobs that we've got no props left. It's the fat tax. That's what it is. Putting fat ta- tax and sweets. Sugar tax. Play the sugar tax. Yeah. I'm sugar, glad we're getting tax. this anyway before Craig appears as well. <laughs> yeah, sugar tax. That, that's what's done it. That's why we don't have any props anymore. That's why we have to go and get South Africans in. Do they have so a sugar tax in South that Africa? 6p for Coke. Yeah, that's it. A tax on deep fried food. So you can't. You're not gonna. You're not gonna bring through. This is. See, I feel right old. This is show my. I feel like I'm getting into the kind of grumpy. Old, you can't. You know. You can't produce props on spinach and hummus. Roman woke mob. <laughs> it's the woke mob, Johnny. It's the woke mob. That's the reason why we don't have why props. Why did we think of this before? Yeah, quinoa. With the bloody avocado you're, toast. Yeah, avocado. Never seen a prop. You never get a prop on avocado toast and quinoa. I bet Ollie Cable eats avocado toast. I would imagine he does. Hey, it's a high fat food. True. Avocado. So it's not a bad thing to eat as a prop. It's a good good prop food. But yeah, it's interesting. I don't know who they I don't know who they're trying to I don't know. How, yeah, I don't know if it's just kind of come along kids and look look how fun it is to push against one another for a bit. You get to walk around the heard, pitch. They heard the conversation I had with Craig last week where he said he hasn't decided what he's gonna do coaching wise and rugby wise next season yet. And decided that we just make a make scrum school for him to go and do that. Go and do that, yeah. Hey kids, if you ever fancy playing walking rugby, be a prop. <laughs> <laughs> do you like pushing stuff and walking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and eating all you want with no judgment <laughs> at all. <laughs> be a prop. Yeah. Your country needs you. That's that's what we need to post is this kind of <laughs> Pierre Schumann with a big... In fact, do you remember that? There's that episode of The Simpsons where Homer tries to become a beast and Dr. Nick says, if, it, <laughs> if the paper goes clear, it's good. That's essentially the <laughs> nutritionist's advice in prop school. <laughs> it's Dr. Nick's advice. Of, <laughs> if you're rubbing on a bit of that's paper, it's not going clear. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that's. I mean, it's good in a way. We've been. I mean, God, since this podcast started, since I started writing for the blog, God, more than ten years ago, we've been talking about a lack of Scottish props, and then we get to a point where we're going, "Oh, good, we got Xander now," um, and then it's like, "Well, we've only got Xander," and then oh, we've got Ollie Kebble and Pierre Schumann, and oh, it's look, and then WP now he realizes suddenly seventy two, and you go, "All right, things are looking a bit shaky." I think the main problem with props is it's the lack of. Game time. I'm and I'm I'm going to keep the prop chat going. So I'm hoping is Craig will join us, and then I'm literally going to move on as soon as Craig comes on this podcast. <laughs> the first thing that he hears is us going. Anyway, that's enough about props. Yeah, <laughs> but it is. It's it's a strange one because I think the problem that we've I think the problem that props have had in Scotland, particularly in Glasgow and Embry, is it's like that lack of consistent game time because it's such a rare. It's it's not a versatile position. As we were told numerous times, you can't switch sides of a scrum, apparently. Um, it's different pushing. But you, it, so because it's not like, you know, you can get your game time as, as a fullback winger because you play fullback wing maybe on the centre. Sometimes you fly off or shift to 12. You, you know, 
it's it's harder for a prop to get that game time in the same way that other positions might move around or be given chances elsewhere. And I think we've had so many good props that have just disappeared or fallen flat. And it's not I don't think they're necessarily bad. It's just they never get into a good vein of form where they're able to get better, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the thing is that, like, it is... I'm glad he's not here to hear me say this. It is such hard work that they do... Like, they're the first to come off. They're off after 50 minutes. It's not like you're playing a whole game ever. Your yeah. props are always the, the first two to get subbed. So you are, you're looking at, like... 50 minutes every two or three weeks if there's if your squad's been rotated. And that is not enough to get really good, I don't think. Yeah. Um, Harley Worthy, hello, Harley. Says, we've got Javan Sebastian, the best prop in the UK. 100%. The How is that, of... you think, oh, I prefer not to speak. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to get here in time. It's really disappointing. I, was really I know, I know. Like, I, I, think we'll see I feel like we've said all we can about props. Props, yeah, that's that's we've exhausted our prop knowledge, Johnny. After the last time we we've did been a podcast, about prop knowledge before, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The last time, I think the last time you and I were on together, we were just going, which one's the right and which one's the this. <laughs> I'm sure someone explained this to me once, and I can't remember. remember. Righty, no, tighty, now, now I can't Lucy. remember. And it's I like can righty mostly... tighty, lefty loosey. No, that's 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 unscrewing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how unscrew can... Jolly. That's got no application in rugby. I can mostly remember which side most of the Scottish props play now as well. I've been, done my, I've been doing my prop homework. Oh, well, that's good. I um, so. Let's have a look, see if we've got any other news. Dave Cherry signed the new Ember deal. Sioni mm-hmm. Tuopoloto signed the new Glasgow deal as well. Some good well, well, yeah, let's talk about that. So that's, yeah, that's, and, and in the um, grand matrix of um, Scottish rugby contract extension bingo, it's a, uh, I think three uh, years is my guess. Yeah, foreseeable future, isn't it? It's three foreseeable years, future. Yeah. Anything more than that, I think, is exceptional or kind of world-breaking, they call it. That's what they said for Jamie yeah. Ritchie or something. But yeah, yeah. yeah foreseeable future like, is three years. Is it not like one committed is future, two long-term, three foreseeable future? Is that right? Yeah, foreseeable is three. I think long-term, two, extended one. Extended is one, yeah. Extended is one, yeah. The four, I think four year in Hamish Watson and Jamie Ritchie territory. Yeah. I think Jamie Ritchie's was five. So, was. which was, that was the the, world, the the longest ever in the club's history kind of territory. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so that, I mean, that's a good signing for Glasgow because he's, it's interesting. I think everyone got very excited when he came in to Glasgow and because of his highlight reels and he, he threw some lovely moves. But he, it's one of those ones where, as a player, and what's exciting about him is you can see him getting better with every game he plays. He's he's obviously yeah. learned a lot since coming to Scotland. He's absorbed, and he is demonstrably a better player than he was when even he kind of made his Scotland debut. Yeah, yeah, he's he's probably had the best year of anybody in the Scotland squad, or in the wider Scotland squad. I think, um, from the Six Nations last year, where he was. All right. I don't think anybody was really blown away by him. Um, I think in the in the Wales game last year, there were people who were quite disappointed in him. I think a lot of Glasgow fans liked him at the start of last season. I think in the autumn, he kind of really showed up as being one of the star performers. And then basically since then, he's kicked on massively. Like since since the European qual or the European games started, kind of just after the autumn, he's been Glasgow's best player by a fairly long way to be honest he's uh really really come on this year so nice to have him sticking around for a while is the question is is he a 12 or a 13 has that question been answered yet because it was something we i think was he was he doing 13 for glasgow and 12 for scotland at one point yeah yeah when when sam johnson was kind of regularly playing 12 Sioni was playing 13 now he seems to be more played more at 12 for glasgow which you'd imagine is where he's gonna be played for scotland yeah and he's yeah. been doing it really well. And he's apparently de- developed an absolutely world class kicking game from twelve as well. Which is which is which good. We'll get onto the Scotland squad later, but that that's always where Scotland have done well, even under Vern Cotter, is having a second kicking option from twelve. Yeah, yeah. The the Calcutta Cup game must have been was it twenty twenty 
one that we won at Twickenham yep. was with Cam Redpath playing 12 and, and kind of spraying it about a bit. Yeah. So that will be interesting to see. Uh, the other thing is, in good news for Boomers, the Inter-District Championship for club players has returned. Woohoo! Districts, Who doesn't love bring the back district? the districts. This is the, uh, yeah. So if this, if, if, if the problem is now, if Scottish rugby improves in any way, that would be why they brought back the districts. <laughs> See that? We've been saying all along, bring back the districts. Bring back the districts. Abolish the pro teams and bring back the districts. That's what will make a good Scotland national team. Team of 15 amateurs from the districts. Put them up against England. They'll win any day. Yeah. Speaking of boomers and the game's gone soft, um, <laughs> the RFU have announced for a, a change to the laws for club level games from next season where you have to tackle below the waist which has caused mass outrage amongst the usual suspects on twitter but seems to be on the day that 55 amateur players have announced they're suing the rfu and world rugby for yep. um brain injuries and long-term health impacts seems like a sensible thing to want to do in the club game to try and mitigate head injuries Yep. Yeah, I've seen all sorts of like official club accounts in England asking people if they want, to, like jokingly, obviously asking people if they, if they want to form a breakaway union. People saying they're they're turning in their registration. This is the last season they're going to play and stuff. And it's like, did you never get taught to tackle? Because yeah. I can remember clear as day the very first time that I turned up to play rugby when I was like eleven or twelve years old. It goes eye to thigh, cheek to cheek. That's how we've always been taught to tackle. Aim for the badge on their shorts. When we get the tackle tubes out even today, and they say rhino on them, obviously, because we've that's what the kind of tackle tubes everybody's got, and they say that you aim for the end. Like, I've always, in 20 plus years, always been taught to tackle round the waist, get your shoulder up against their thigh, wrap their legs up and push, because it doesn't matter how big somebody is, if you wrap their legs together and take them away that they're going to fall down so all these people that are like i can't believe that they've done this to rugby this is disgusting who taught you to tackle and how long have you been tackling wrong for? Yeah. because you're meant like, to tackle around someone's legs that's what it's always been. when you when you see co kids being coached in tackling for the first time someone has a ball and the other person's on their knees and you walk up yeah. slowly to them side by side and the person on their knees tackles you and that's just yeah. supposed to get you used to tackling and get the height right it's not yeah it, it's just um, in a way i hope that they some of these people do form a breakaway union because that's how natural selection works yep i'd be fine with that yeah it's not there is a kind of um th there is a suggestion and dougie lowe's alluded to this is that there's a lot of people kind of talk about this, this france experiment oh actually below the um, leg tackles causes more injuries I, I, it doesn't cause more head injuries. I think that's the kind of that I've seen any evidence of. It may it may result in there may have been a result in leg injuries for all we know. But it but it's head in the ultimately it's the head that everyone's trying to protect here. It's not. Yep. We're not trying to protect the legs. You can you know, it, it's people's long term mental health and mental well being and yep. ability to function as a human that and we're trying to protect. Most people say that like what happens is you get a knee to the head or you, you catch a leg in the head or something. So I will say once again, who taught you how to tackle and why were you not listening? Because the yeah. whole point is you're about to get your head away from their knees. That's the idea. Yeah. I was taught when I was like 11 how to tackle without putting your head into somebody's knees or smash your shoulder into their face. And all these it's people are like, oh, this is disgusting. It's like, it's not. This is how it's always been. Yeah, I'm not gonna properly. I'm not gonna play rugby anymore because the game's gone because I'm not allowed to tackle somebody in the face. I do, it's just yeah. It's unbelievable. It's a very sensible thing to do. And you would imagine that it's probably coming to Scotland. Someone one of our patrons, and forgive me, I can't remember your name, said he's playing rugby in England and he's six foot five. Look, as a tall man, you've got my sympathy. Bending over is not easy, especially as a 40 year old man, but <laughs> life finds a way. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure you'll. I'm sure you'll live. I'm sure you'll find another skill. If you're six foot you five, just, I mean, what are you doing tackling anyway? Leave it to the yeah. Leave it to just the just do what I do and ask other people to do it. Yeah, just just you know, 
put yourself in a uh, point yourself char- in charge of defense and just keep shifting out on the line and telling other <laughs> pointing at pointing at rocks and telling people to get in there yeah like i want to be perfectly clear that just because i have been coached in tackling and i know how to tackle doesn't mean i have any interest in doing it i, I find <laughs> ways to avoid having to do it but i know how to do it that's like if you don't want who, to do uh, it there's ways to avoid it my teacher once said, to me, our geography teacher once told us, said, um, the best drivers don't put the brakes on. So the best rugby players don't need to tackle. Yeah. They just, you just dazzle people with you. You distract them somehow. <laughs> Close hand magic. That's what you do, Johnny, isn't it? You just pull yeah, a coin exactly. out the rear and the soap afterwards, you get the ball on your Slight own. Slight of hand tricks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Craig's still not with us and it's half past. So I think we can, one of the things we wanted to talk about tonight and, and hopefully Craig will be with us shortly to talk about this is the Thistles squad has been announced so the squad has been announced but we've got the so this is in effect the um women's first Scottish women's pro team and we've got a 37 player squad now interestingly and we didn't touch on this last week but a couple of players have been signed by English clubs so there is still Johnny and here's Craig just in time. Look at that, perfect. Yeah, so that's a we that's spoke about covered... props for like twenty minutes, Craig. Yeah, just in you the hope. Can, I've just seen Dougie Low putting one loose, three tight, which <laughs> always <laughs> always makes me worry about what you've been talking about. Yeah, we we were good. The whole thing we dragged out for as long as we could because we were really hoping you'd come on and we'd just go. And that's enough about props. Let's move on. <laughs> We got we muddled through, Johnny, didn't we? We just we're just talking about we the did. thistles, Craig. We've just started talking about it. We're pleased you've joined us for this bit. I was, saying, I was saying to Johnny, the um obviously the squad's been announced today, but what was interesting in advance of that is there's a couple of players, and Ellis, who's been on this podcast previously, and when we did the episode on uh, trans women in, in rugby, mm. um, has now signed for sale. So it would seem like the SIU's policy is still if we can get people contracts in Premier 15s, let's do that. And the pro team, the Thistles pro team is for everybody else. And that might be people who, for whatever reason, don't feel that they want to move, um, which some people wouldn't because understandably this is a new initiative or for people who aren't able to get a contract within the Prem 15s. For you, Craig, is that a good? Is that still the right policy at this time while we're developing it? Is it is it a good thing that we're given kind of players experience of going and playing in the Prem 15s, where may, I don't know, maybe it's a bit more more competitive. Yes, I, I think I think it's you know as as we see when we we see a lot of our, our even just for example Scotland players, Scotland male Scotland players going to. Gloucester or going to um, uh, Saracens or whatever, you seem to see their game. It, oh, a, it exposes them to different situations, but it also exposes them to more, more and more professional teams and different ways of working. So, for me, I, I I would encourage it as much much as possible. It seems that a lot of the players who have gone, the Jade Conkles etc., who have gone to the Premier Fifteens, have improved and have moved on their game more and more. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like the thistles. I like the idea of the thistles because, for example, um, again, someone who's been on the pod, Rachel Law, um, is in the is in the team. Um, and it's going to give her the opportunity to play a far, you know, hopefully a higher level rugby and expose, um, if you excuse the, the, the terminology, but expose herself to more people so that um, she gets the more opportunities to be looked at and selected, and me, you know, because obviously she's a vet, so she's, you know, she's got her her, her own career. Um, but if she wants to go and play Premier Fifteens and then hopefully get back into the Scotland team, then it's a it's a great opportunity. So the squad then, so we've got a thirty seven uh, player squad. We've got a new head coach in Claire Cruikshank, uh, who has been announced, uh, who was previously the Sweden women's head coach. And has worked worked with the coaching group last year as part of the rugby world coach. We've got Chris Laidlaw, um, who is a rugby academy coach, and Stuart Corsa, who's a performance coach. Um, it's uh, it's a bit. I mean, it's been touted, Johnny, as a bit of a a, a kind of a Six Nations warm up for the women, in that they're going to play f- the the Welsh and the Irish development sides. 
so it's kind of almost like a mini URC, I guess. It's understandable, I guess, at this point in time that it's not that it's been cobbled together. You've got three unions who are have now in the, sh you know, in 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 very very recently committed to a women's professional rugby program. So it's maybe understandable, I guess, that this is being touted as a warm up to the Six Nations. But you would hope it would become something more permanent longer term. Yeah, I think with, you know with the initial announcement, they said that they wanted to have two teams from every from every country involved, which would be brilliant if we can get to that. It's kind of some some meaningful competition week in week out if we can have enough players. Obviously, because we are talking about people going to Premier Fifteens, and I know a lot of the Welsh squad have gone to Premier Fifteens as well. So it's it's a question of of whether the player pool. Is there to make two squads? Are we going to start bringing people back? We've got to look at then how the long-term funding and stuff goes for that. But I think it's a, it's a really good start. The fact that the tickets are free as well um, mm. is brilliant. Hopefully there'll be some decent decent crowds there because playing in front of a crowd, I think, is something that's quite kind of underrated in terms of how you prepare for things like the Six Nations, especially when crowds are getting huge for the Six Nations. Now England have sold 30,000 tickets for their France game already so you've got to kind of prepare yourself for the atmosphere as well yeah it's maybe i think the one disappointing thing about it um is that they haven't picked up a broadcaster for it as far as i can see obviously we had we, we had via play now that yeah. was free sports before that was picking up some of the women's game and i don't know for me that's that's going to be key going forward that if it's you need to make get somehow get this on the telly and the you know the sre the, the broadcast the super six for free um they've managed to get broadcast deals for that they've broadcast stuff on youtube channels before and that for me yeah it's great let's get people along and you're right johnny get people into the stadium but i think making it available for people to watch as well is really important um and i know craig it's something the urc have said it's the their kind of number one thing they want to develop as a women's league and the way to get people interested yeah. is to make it available for people to to be able to see and to watch and that's how you generate the interest in it yeah, I, 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 I just feel that the especially the SRU should just treat it like a like a Super Six game, um, and 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 do you know go down the route of exactly what they did with the Super Six, um, even if it's just onto onto a YouTube channel um, or a streaming service, because I think anything you know the minute people start seeing that there's opportunity for sponsors to come in who then attract more of a TV audience as well or want more of a TV audience. So it just kind of moves moves on from there. Um, and, and I think it really should be kind of, I'm not saying everything with the Super 6 is ideal, but I think it's, it should be treated like a Super 6 sort of team because it is a mixture of professional and, uh, and, and non-professional um, women going forward, you know. And the content's just so much better from the women's game, Johnny. I think that's un unarguable that you look at the stuff that was going out on TikTok, you look at the stuff that they do on the social media channels, and I think you can... You know, the men's game, I think, has hit a bit of a a glass ceiling, I think, if you will. It's, you know, the, the men's game, I think, in Scotland is as popular as it's ever going to get. You're never going to get more popular than football, no matter how successful the team becomes. We've got... Murrayfield almost for most for most men's game, but for, I think that the potential is there with the women's game to grow it. And I think it's, I I like the fact they're called the Thistles, for example. I think it's great that we've come rather than calling it a combined, you know, the regions combined fifteen or whatever it is the the Irish have got the provinces or well, the Irish come the Thistles has has got a nice ring to it. It's it's a an identifiable, for one of a better expression, brand that people can get yeah. behind and start supporting. Yeah, it's de it's definitely the best branded of the three. Um, yeah, combined provinces fifteen is what the Irish was called, and the Welsh was just called development fifteen. <laughs> like, well, that is one thing, and I think I get the impression that that like a lot of the TikTok stuff and that by the women's team is quite player driven. So mm. I'd like to see them be be a little bit more involved in it, or given the chance at least to be a bit more involved. Obviously, you've got a lot of other stuff to think about. But the women's players in the lead up to the World Cup and things like that came out with significantly better stuff on their own channels than uh, Stuart Hogg 
hide it behind the door to scare Duhad van der Merva. Like, yeah. it's it's funny, but it was funny the first time, not so funny the like eighth time. Whereas the yeah. women's team, somebody like Rona Lloyd in particular, is uh, is just makes brilliant stuff just off her own back. And obviously, I think I get the impression that she's just like bored in the hotel. But I would like to see them be involved. Yeah, a lot more. And I think that's that's how you grow, isn't it? Because especially, I think, I don't know, I'm sure my age here again. Or this is the second time I've done. They like young people. I remember, you know, I remember being, I remember being young, Craig, and, <laughs> and buying all the, getting my copy of Melody Maker and or you know the, a copy of it. You know, you, know, you get the program for the rugby, or you get, you know, match, you know, shoot magazine or Royal. Ro- you want to devour everything you can learn as a young person about the people you're interested in. And that's mm-hmm. what's really important, I think, for for young fans who want to get behind a Scottish women's pro team is they want to know the players. That's that's how you get people through, get them interested in the players. Find you know, I'm not saying I'm not talking about sharing their national insurance numbers and their dates of birth. It's the what are they interested in, what do they do, what are they like, what's their personality like, and I think that's. They, they've got there's more personality in kind of you know one women's player in Scotland at the minute than the entire Scotland men's squad for example they're much more entertaining they're much more interesting I think yeah, yeah it's, I think I think also you know and and this is no disrespect to the to the women the Scottish women players who came before because of you know I know a lot of the Scottish women players who've come from come before but it's a very new game. So you don't have a lot of this, well, in my day, this is how we did it with women's rugby. It's more, right, this is how this is how we are going to do this. Because, the, you know, the women's rugby has accelerated over the last 10 years from being hidden away and, and, and people not, um, uh, you know, people not wanting, to, don't, not thinking it's the right thing to all of a sudden we've now got this, fantastic, you know, these athletes coming through that are working hard and doing a great job. Um, people are, you know, we forget what the the Blazers and the, and, the, and the Slacks Brigade have, have missed out is that there's 50% of the population, including, you know, all of the young women that are out there, the young girls that are out there that are, again, just as you say, they're looking for content. They're looking to support something. They, don't, they maybe don't want to support football or they maybe not want, you know, they want to support rugby. And, they're now starting to see it that there's there's a, there's a huge buy-in, and um and and just as you say, the TikTok. I think I think for me one of the biggest changes was TikTok sponsoring the Six Nations last year, uh, and it really just drove a hugely a huge engagement um within this within the sport, and 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 all of a sudden you're starting to see these, you know, the ticket the ticket sales going up and up and up for the games. Um, uh, and I, I I'm incre- uh, you know I'm incredibly pleased and really really happy with what's going on and 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 hopefully the SRU fingers crossed the SRU don't don't muddle too much with it um, and think right we're going to take it down the men's game route um, obviously pay them correctly but um, I think if they if they, they they don't have blinkers on with it and actually open their eyes a little bit more you you might find it becomes more and more something that everyone wants to go watch. Yeah, I think that's it for me. That I like. I think the SRU are ahead of the game than Wales or Ireland, just purely on the base that they've given them a, a name. I think that shows yeah. some commitment to growing a brand around it. I think my big concern would be that Ireland, in particular, have been notoriously slow with the women's game, and there have been issues in the Irish game. I think Wales less so because I think they're they're obviously. The, I don't know, is it the president or the chief exec have come in very quickly and turned things around for the women's game in Wales and made it a priority. It's how do you, it's making sure, I guess, that we're not held back by the other nations. That if they're not, if they're going to mess around and say, we're going to take two seasons to build this up, that the SRU say, well, we're going to make a big play for joining the Prem 15s. And I'm sorry, but if you're, if you snooze, you lose. And if that leaves you out of it, tough. But we move. I I think you really want to see from after the Six Nations firm plans, Johnny, for a regular professional women's rugby competition with representation from Scotland. Whether that be that we join the Prem 15s because the other two are just too slow, or whether or not there is a 
a, a mirror URC league. It needs yeah, to happen. And, the pace needs to keep going, I guess. Yeah, and like obviously what we all want, and we said this around the time of the end of the World Cup, is we're at a stage now where you cannot have amateur teams at the sharp end of a World Cup. So we want every country to come up with a serious, organised, professional women's setup. At the same time, we can't be beholden to waiting for other people to do that. You're right. So if if these other countries can't keep up with us, we need to look after ourselves. We need, need to go and find a way to do it. I think what we do have on our side is the URC, because the URC have shown themselves to be very forward-thinking, really, really good with the branding and engagement and stuff. Obviously, having Rock Nation on board is a huge part of that. And I think they will be driving it. I think they expect now that this competition is going to kick on. And that I would expect to see them putting pressure on Wales and Ireland. If Wales and Ireland aren't keeping up to say, look, this is what we're doing and you need to get your act together and, and be doing it. Yeah. It's just it's just an exciting time. You know, this weekend you've got the Thistles playing. We've also got um, all the representative regions, under-16s and under-18s teams playing um, this weekend as well. Um, so women's and girls rugby has really stepped on um, and uh, I was concerned when we talked about when we did the uh, review of the year I was hoping for uh, you know more buy-in to the women's game etc but especially at girls rugby and a, and a good pathway for the girls it seems to have been it seems to have been there and I, and I wasn't aware of it and it's it's working well um, and I'm really pleased to see it happening yeah, and I think that's it. This is this is what we were hoping for, isn't it? And this is great. It's it's kind of I think we were what we might have expected was a very slow burn of we'll get we'll we'll, we'll get some more contracts on the go. We'll do you know we'll we'll kind of get a few more players out playing in the Prem 15s. But to actually have a team that there is kind of good coaches going into that the and it's the you know you've got Megan Gaffney and they've got experienced players in that squad as well Craig it's not just a kind of development squad from Scotland's point of view there are good players in that squad yeah very much so um including uh including a big shout out for Molly Pullman from the How of Fife um who's come through from the from the juniors all the way through from P3 all the way through the How of Fife and uh and, and through the Harlequins and then she ended she's gone down to um uh, Watsonians and plays uh, in the in the, the development um, team for Scotland. So it, it's all coming together. Um, we also, if you look at even if you, if 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 anyone has looked at you look at the the Cali and the Glasgow and Edinburgh coaches for the under 16s and under 18s, there's some serious coaches there too. Um, it's really exciting stuff to see. Um, and fingers crossed, we, it, it continues. Um, so yeah, really really good. Is that it though? I mean, is that it? I guess is it, and and you'll be able to answer this, Craig. That is it more exciting coaching women's rugby because because it's new and it's fresh and they're excited and it's not just the same kind of faces every year who are going through the motions. It's 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 people who are new to the sport and new to and and there's a, a, a bit of a bit more of a buzz around it. I guess. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a mixture. Um, uh... For for me, it was it was. I can only go with with with, with my experiences. My experiences were more. I, I wanted my club to be relevant, um, and I wanted to provide a place for all the 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 women who are coming through the How of Fife to play rugby if they want to play rugby, and I think, um, and also also Mrs M. Um, was very much why haven't we got a women's team etc. So you know, there was a bit of pressure on that side too. But I think. Looking at some of the coaches that are in the in the pathway now, there's some players who have either played for Scotland, you know, women players who have either played for Scotland and are coming back to give back, um, and then there's also development, some development officers who officers who have been involved in in part of the SRU and and then they've moved on and they've come back to to coach. But I think to answer your main question, yes, that you. You don't have this constant, this is how we do it within rugby. This is how the men's game do it. You should do it this way. It's very much an open book. Obviously, you've got your set pieces and you've got your... But you can go out and, you know, you've got to try and bring players in. So you've got to come up with different ideas to attract players to your club, which includes using social media and, and, and opening it out that way. You're, you're, 
it's a it's a it's almost a blank piece of paper. And so yeah, I, I found it very invigorating. I really enjoyed it. Um and um you know you also and I'm not gonna go into oh women are different and men are different, but you got a lot more questions. Um why are we doing this? Rather than just shout at someone that they have to go and run here and pass a ball here, they, they would say, Well, why are we actually trying to do that? And and it's it, it was really just as an as an old coach um and, and an old rugby player, it was invigorating to see people you know, people interested in wh- wh- why actually is that happening? Why are we doing that to do we, is it to do this, you know? So yeah. I, you could probably tell by my answer that I'm a, it's a really good thing to be involved in, and um, I, I do recommend it to anyone that's wanting to coach. Yeah, it's very, very exciting times for women's rugby in Scotland um, and, and and indeed the world. Um, now, we're coming to the we've got 50 minutes left of the main podcast, <coughs> and we're going to do the Patreon one in a minute. I said at the start, we going to do a trigger warning for the fact we are going to discuss Rufus McLean uh, and his guilty plea for domestic abuse. And we're going to discuss that now. So that's just for anybody that that, that that doesn't, for for whatever reason, understandably doesn't want to listen to that. That's 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 what we're moving on to now. So for people who aren't aware, um, Rufus McLean has pled guilty to uh, charges of domestic abuse against a, his former partner, um, and that has come out in a news report and there's a, you can go and read it online it's um quite horrendous it's the worst kind of abuse you could imagine i mean you know it's 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 coercive behavior it's 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 direct violence it's not easy reading uh he's pled guilty there's a couple of issues i think i wanted us to discuss um and i don't want to what about to read about it um, the first is, and I think this is the best, the only way I can kind of think of us to tackle it is if we go by the club response and the SRU response first, and then we can work into what 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 does it say about underlying cultures in Scottish rugby and perhaps society in general. But the, the response, Johnny, I think from Glasgow Warriors, understandably, as they've said, he's suspended. There's, there's a dis- there was a disciplinary hearing today, we understood, to decide his future. He's pled guilty. He's waiting sentencing. When I looked this morning, I found a pitch side interview with Rufus McLean from December and an article from November from the club's website in which Rufus McLean is the featured player interview. Now, I find it very hard to believe that Glasgow were not aware that he had a charge hanging over him and that he was due to go to court. It seems to me hard to believe that the first Glasgow heard of it was when the Daily Record reported about what had happened in court. Yeah. Um, When I saw it, and I think I was I think I was the first to see it yesterday. I think I passed it on to you guys. Um initially you see Glasgow's statement, and I was quite I was actually quite pleased with the, the initial statement because the statement is very blunt. It's it's doesn't leave a lot of room to kind of think about it the wrong way or misinterpret it. It just says he's suspended. We have no time for this sort of behavior, and it's completely unacceptable. We're having a hearing. And I was like, great, that's that's pretty much, that's exactly what you want to see from your club when that sort of thing appears. And then obviously you read the news article, what was going on, when it was going on, when this all happened, and you start to think, all right, okay, there's actually bits here that don't really add up. And the fact that, like you say, they've, the, the pitch side interview is still on the website. The date of that pitch side interview is interesting. Uh, the article with the interview with him is still on the website. Like that's, it's not an onerous job to go take that off the website. And yeah. I would have liked to have seen that to happen by now. So there's two scenarios I can see, Craig. Right. One is Glasgow knew, or somebody in Glasgow or the SRU were aware of what was going on, right? Because you know, there's only so many times he can claim he's going to the dentist or got some other reason he has to be off work before someone starts asking why he's constantly awake. Because he's going to have to go attend interviews with his lawyers, go attend court and stuff like that. So it's 
he would need time off from work to go and do that. So it seems like, you know, one scenario is someone in Glasgow, the SIU, knew that was happening, but still allowed, didn't didn't make the decision to place him on garden and leave, which lots of others, when you look across, you know, look what's happened with um, was it Mason Greenwood in Manchester United, you know, there's precedent for that. You can just say to someone, look, until this is concluded, you will pay you, but you're on garden and leave, and we'll yeah. you know we'll see what the outcome is. There's precedent yeah. for that, uh, and but and they have allowed him to continue to be used in media work. The other less plausible but still possible scenario is Glasgow genuinely didn't find out until it was reported in the press, but then someone in the club, whether it's a fellow player or a coach or whoever must have known some it seems to me impossible that either the club hierarchy didn't know or somebody somewhere in the club didn't know that this was happening or had happened it's it's difficult because i th- i think someone knew there's someone's got to have known obviously because of just what you said you know he, he's going to have to go and attend interviews and and and, and the, there's there's worst case scenario with the the guys that he or he's friends with at the club may have been interviewed because they may have been out with him when he's he's when he's um he's he's um causing problems etc. The problem you have is 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 legally what do you do? Because obviously my first thoughts are for the young lady that was involved in the in the, in, in the in the issues that she's she's had to suffer. You also have the the if he's saying he's not guilty for a period of time, then what do you do with him? Because you just set him aside and say, well, obviously we have to be careful with this, so we're going to set you aside and guard and leave. Or do we say, right, well, if you're pleading not guilty and we believe you, then you continue on at the at the club as 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 normal. Um, and then, so when did Glasgow know he was going to be that he's, a, he's guilty, and when was the guilty plea being put in? That's the that that's probably the, the 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 crux of the matter. On the other side of things, I think it's poor judgment to have him doing media work while he's going through this, because it's it's no matter again as we've talked about with 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 SPU, et cetera, the optics aren't good. No matter what happens, no matter who's you know, um, it, it must be awful for the person that's going through this that he's that he's um, that he's abusing to see him, you know, on YouTube, on 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 TV, on the website, the SRU website, on the Glasgow website. So it must be a terrible thing to see. So it, it, it's really it's an absolute minefield, and, I, and I'm I'm glad there's more people out there that paid far more money than I am, or much much more smarter than I am, um, to to sort this out. Uh, you're, the thing yeah. is, you're right. The way they've tackled it is that, like, if he's if he's come to them and said, "Listen, this is happening. I didn't do it. I'm not guilty of this, and I will plead not guilty, and it will come out that I'm not guilty." I have no problem if Glasgow have no reason to doubt that with them believing them. But you've also got to be careful knowing that you don't know for sure. You can say, all right, we we believe you, but also we probably don't want you being in interviews, being on the front page of programmes, being yeah. on all of this until absolutely. that's sorted out. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And I think this is the bottom this is the bottom line from either one of those scenarios speaks of a a wider cultural problem in society, but also within the SIU and the club about the seriousness with with which they've treated male violence towards women. Because the first reaction has been either, oh, it's all right, Rufus, don't worry about it. If you say you're not guilty, you're not guilty, son. It's just, you know, and, and, and almost like dismissed it. It, it. We'll worry about it later. You carry on playing because play, getting, you, getting you playing for Glasgow is the priority. That that to me is a massive cultural issue. You look at how other other sporting clubs have treated alleged perpetrators of domestic abuse, and it's been zero tolerance. You know, fine, you say you're not guilty, that's fine, but you we we are not playing you. You can come and train. You can come and we'll you know. Obviously, they've got duties to them as an employee, 
but he didn't have to play for Glasgow during that period. And the, there's an easy line in that. You know, it's just going for personal reasons. He's not playing for personal reasons. That's all they need to say. Nobody's allowed to dig into that anymore. That's that. That's all they needed to say. The other side is, fair enough. Okay, let's say Glasgow didn't know until they entered the guilty plea. Somebody in the club knew. So there is a cultural problem then amongst the players that they, by their silence, are condoning the possibility that one of their, well, you know, the condoning the serious, I suppose, you know, the, a lack of seriousness about, the, you know, male on female violence, that that is somehow okay that he's talked to his mates about it and they've either been silent about it or they're in on in on it in a kind of like, that's terrible, that's happening. And we we're, we're, we're all sworn to secrecy. And I think that's for me, I think I'm not, I'm, all I'm saying is that there are questions, there are a lot of questions out of this. And I'm not accusing anybody of doing or failing to do anything. I'm just saying, there are legitimate questions that need to be asked. And it, it can, it's not enough that the Glasgow say, we've suspended Rufus McLean. And everyone goes, well done, you put a lovely statement. Oh, they've sacked him. That's enough. Because I think it needs to go further than that. Say, okay, who knew what when? What was the response? And if it's, well, the club didn't know, it's like, well, what did your mates know? What's their attitude? What's going on within the club? And to a certain extent, because some of the stretches back to when he was a youngster, even probably pre-Glasgow, What's the culture like in the school he's come from? And I'm not picking on private schools for anyone who gets into, you know, that I would ask that question of any school he's come to. This is a, when you look at his behavior and the behavior that's described, it, it's not, a, you know, little thing. It, it, it's not a gray areas at all. It is com- someone somewhere within a yeah. group that he is with has said that is okay or has failed to say that is not okay. To, for, because because that doesn't just that that behavior doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It comes from somewhere. It's it's I I, I there's two set two things for me. Um, first of all, um, if you talk to well in my not my group, but if you talk to any any guy within a rugby club, and ninety probably ninety nine percent of them, when you say. Um, you know, or that person such and such has been has been abusing his, his wife or his girlfriend or or a person in the street. You would expect well, a lot of the guys I I knew, and I've never come across this particular scenario. But when they were getting out of hand with certain things, they got a slap for it and told to settle down and don't do it again because it was dealt with within the team. That's the old way of doing it. What I'm more concerned about, and it's and and please, I'm not trying to downplay. Um, what's happened to this young lady and, and the awful thing that's happened to her. But if you look at, at Glasgow as, and I'm not just picking on Glasgow because there's other teams out there that have had this problem. There's one, for example, there's one certain teammate who celebrated for going out in a Batman costume and getting into trouble in a, in a, in a kebab shop. And that was, that was, um, that was violence. That was there was there was violence involved with that one, and it's almost it's not joked about, but it's almost who oh, you know, he's a lad going out and and going a bit of trouble, and and that's the sort of thing that that needs knocked out because I'm not saying that anybody's put thought oh Rufus he's got into himself in a bit of trouble put their arm around him, I'm not saying that. I just think that if it's all right to go out and get in a bit of trouble on a drinking night out. Um, when you're having a go at, a, 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 when you you know when you're out as a team and you're and you're physically violent to someone else, that's not okay. So it breeds, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's a broken window effect. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think on that side of things, and <laughs> I'm going to say this: in my day, if someone was violent with someone, he's gave as a team, you you. You, you sat them down and told them if you continue to do that, you're not going to be involved in the team. And and and, and hopefully that would be... I think oh, the thing is... It was never enough, is, I, Craig, I, I, I I agree. And I think that's, you know, certainly from talking to my dad, that's that's the kind of, it's the traditional kind of, you know, male attitude towards male on female domestic abuses. Or the lads went and had a word with them and it stopped. Or the lads the lads knocked it on the head and it would never happen you never, yeah. honestly Cammy that yeah. would never happen you never you never stop someone who's a domestic a no domestic exactly abuser. I think that's the point that and, that's, and it's not just and it's not you know it's not I think that's the that was the kind of traditional male approach to it was like oh you you tell you find it about and everyone kind of says oh you don't do that but I think that's the 
it, it's the it's an older, I suppose, understanding of what domestic abuse is. And some of the stuff in the Rufus McLean thing that's come out, I think, more speaks about attitudes towards women in general, maybe yes. young younger yeah. players. I think yeah. that's the issue. Is it's it's the day to day. There must, you know, like what I say, it doesn't appear from nowhere. That it's the day to day way that women, you know, how are women talked about in the Glasgow dressing room? Yeah, how are women talked about in the school that he's come from? How are women talked about in his group of friends? Do you know, are they talked about as equals? Are they talked about as human beings, or are they talked about as possessions? Yeah. To, to have and, and and trophies to win because that's the problem that that's the that's the small behaviors that are easy to dismiss that build to that then allow and permit I guess Johnny this the, the kind of horrific behavior that then results yeah no that that's exactly what it is and it's kind of like what Craig says it is about what sort of culture you have in your club like if you allow small things like that if you allow people to talk that way, then you're opening the door for you're allowing people to go out at night and get into a scrap. And then once you've opened the door for that, then you open the door for the next thing, then you open the door for the next thing. So this is obviously the worst end of it that we've seen. This is horrendous what Rufus McLean's accused of. What in fact, we're able to say what he's accused of, what he's played guilty to, what he has said he's done is awful, awful stuff. But it comes from allowing smaller stuff, allowing smaller stuff, allowing smaller stuff. And it's and it's a cultural thing for where, from wherever he's been has he's been in a he's been in a circumstance where things have been allowed that have then got to the point where he thinks he can do what he's done. Yeah. And I think that's you know you, you can speculate all you want about you know what he'll do next and things like that. And I'm not particularly interested. I, I think you know I I'm one for believing in redemption, but I think probably he's shot his rugby career in the foot. I think, he, you know, I'm not ruling out that anybody can be redeemed. But I think it's, as a lesson to to others, there needs to be, a, it needs to have a lasting impact. Something like this is serious. And I think the kind of people saying, oh, well, if he goes and does a course, or oh, it'd be a shame to see his rugby career go. No, it's, it's not a shame yeah. to go. You wouldn't, other crimes, people would quite happily say, "Well, that's it; he's done." And and domestic abuse is is no different. And I think it's those kind of attitudes, and it's those kind of the what about you? I think diminishes that. And I th- so I'm not. I don't think we're being. You know, I think some people have said, particularly in the, the, on, on Twitter and Facebook, we've been overly critical of Glasgow and the SRU, and and I don't think we're being critical. We're just raising legitimate questions that this. This cannot be the end of the process. It can't be just, oh, Rufus McLean's gone, problem solved. He was a bit of a bad apple. That that something something has happened somewhere. And I think it's hard to believe that there isn't some there hasn't been something going on at the club. Now, whether it's amongst younger players, whether or not it's a small group, I don't know. But you would hope the club would do something about it. And I don't mean a sticking plaster of we'll get somebody to talk about male on female violence. We'll do a We'll do a white ribbon campaign for a couple of months and then it'll, we'll hope it goes away like some root and branch. What's going on here? How has this been allowed? How have we got to a point where someone's been convicted of this before someone has called out the behaviour before that? I think, and that's I think the it's, worry for me. Yeah, I think it's, it's for me, um, you can, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm probably going over what you just said, Carrie, but it, just in my mind, you can cut the cancer out and get rid of it. But it, it can it's the after effects of that. And it's understanding um you almost God, I want to say something here. I'm trying I'm trying to be you owe it to the person that he has been abusing um to understand or to understand what has been going how the club are have uh, how this has happened and how the how if there has been any anything within the club that has not not helped them but co- not covered it up but just just kept it under you know under the public eye uh, yeah. you know and understanding a why he's been doing it understanding why why we he thought he could he could do it and why and and what was the role within the team and the club 
um, that that are, that are, you know almost it, it's been in there somewhere and someone's just as you say someone's known about it and it's understanding that it's not right, it's not, it you know and and if he has lost his career over it, that and and rather than saying oh it's a shame for him he's lost his career over a mistake it's not a mistake it's a it's a it's a human nature thing that's been yeah. you know he wasn't born that way you know. And I think that's the the thing for me, Johnny. Kind of just before we kind of wrap the discussion up, is it, it's not just Glasgow because Rufus McLean has come through systems within Scotland, and one there's the players, but there's coaches as well. So how how you know we, what we don't know is has it has it been known that Rufus has this within him and it's been an issue with him, and coaches have gone, I he's a good player, you know, he's he's one of the better players. Let's. We'll just we'll ignore that side of it. Do you know what I mean? It's not it's not causing us a pro- it's not causing a problem in camp. Or one yeah. of the lads have yeah. said he got he, he's it's... one of the lads have said he's a bit he, he's shouting his girlfriend on the phone. We'll not worry about it. It's not our problem because he's our best winger and, and we don't want to rock the boat. That's the kind. And again, that's a question. I'm not saying anybody's done that, but it's the kind of thing I think is a a sign of good corporate health would be that the SLU would want to look into the structures he's come through to understand whether or not it could have been picked up earlier because perhaps there was an opportunity where Rufus McLean's career could have been saved by someone saying, this isn't right. We need to help you and support you to change your behavior and your attitudes. And that's, yeah. you know, so how long is it, you know, it, see again, inconceivable that he's, he's hidden that part of him for so long. It's, it's a real sort of who knew what, when, like he's he signed his professional contract in in June 2020, and this was according to the news article already going on by then. It's according to the news article, it stopped in January 2021. He was named in his first Scotland squad in January 2021. So there are some bits and pieces where, again, you know, we can't say for sure. You don't want to jump to any conclusions. We're we're saying we don't want to hear what about any from. People saying, oh, you know, what about his career? What about his redemption? Whatever. We we don't want to make it look like we're saying, oh, well, so how how did Scotland not know about this? How, how was nobody involved? But there are bits of his career that overlap with bits of these incidents, and you would want to know who was involved, what they knew, and when they knew it, I think. Well, and, I, I, and you're right, it's good, it's good corporate health to say, listen, this is what we found out. This is what we got from our investigation, because otherwise you leave the door open for people to say, "All right, well, how come you signed up to a professional contract where this is happening? Did you really not know? How come he miraculously stopped apparently when you signed when you announced him in a Scotland squad? How did you not know then? Like they, that's the sort of things that people are going but, to want to know. But there is that you know, and a, a, someone's made a very very good point in the in, in the conclusion in, in the comments, I should say. And what what we also have to remember is that a lot of domestic abusers um, are like duck, ducks or swans in the water and n- people around them do not know it's happening and the, mm. it's it's very hidden um, and and so you, you, you there could be a very there's a very very good chance that his team a lot a lot of his teammates knew nothing about it and that's and that you know I think we need we, we can be open to that possibility I think it's it's like it's it's the and it's more about the cut. I guess it's about finding about the underlying culture in which this was allowed to happen. So maybe he was hiding it, but there was something that has given, almost given him permission. There is a culture somewhere that's given him permission to do that. That might not be within the club. It might not be within the SRU, but somewhere along the line, there has been a culture that has given him permission to act in this way and believe it's okay. I think that it could be, you know, we get you, you do an SRU investigation and say, this was one bad. It we've really looked into this. We're happy with. We've spoken to a number of players. We've spoken to coaches, and this was never known about the. You know, people people with no vested interest, past players, whatever, have spoken about the you know positive culture towards attitudes towards women in the dressing room, and this is just one person who's, you know, is an exception to to how everybody else behaves in the club. That's a possibility. We're not closed off to that. But I think when it's something this serious, I think if the SIU wants to show that it's very serious about women's rights and very serious about female about male on female violence, which is a big issue in society, then 
it needs to do something just to to check that this isn't you know what influence circumstance may have had on the outcome and it might be nothing it might be this is like i said you know it's an exception it's it's a one one off and that's fine but i think if you are if they're serious about it they would they would do more than just we'll sack him and hope that's the end of it that they would do some further investigation into it yeah so if you have been affected by anything whether you are a woman whether you're a man gay straight trans and it's an issue you want to talk about or as affects you you can contact scotland's domestic abuse helpline which is 0800 027 1234 so it's 0800 027 1234 it is an issue that affects everybody and all parts of society and there are places you can go to get help and support if you need it that's the end of the main podcast um what we're going to do is we'll go over to patreon now after a short break for those patrons we'll have our patreon episode where we're going to talk about the we might touch on this a little bit more if if johnny wants to vent a little bit more we can do um, otherwise, we'll be talking about the Scotland men's squad and, and any other kind of hands in the rock that we have. For the moment, though, uh, for this week, it is goodbye from me, a good Friday from Johnny and Craig. Bye, all. Bye, all. They've changed the way you do this. Oh, yeah, I was going to, was going to give you all pl- plaudits for being professional compared to John Anderson, but you know, it's just. It's, oh, you it's really they've put more. They've put more buttons in to press. It's not good. <laughs> Craig, he oh, left so, us covered up oh, for yeah. about seven seconds.